Elizabeth. This is Reading Riley. We're doing a January wrap up today. I'm going to try to make it as quick as I can because I have a lot of books to go through because I did a lot of reading this month. But if you're new to my channel, um, I would very much appreciate it if you would go down below and click the subscribe button. That way you'll be notified of my future content. It's been a pretty good reading month, I'm not going to lie. I have enjoyed myself. I've read some excellent, excellent books. I've read really only one that I was very disappointed in, but we'll get to that. So anyway, let's get right into it. My first book of 2021 was His and Hers by Alice Feeney. I gave this four stars. I really enjoyed it. It was a fun, fast-paced thriller set in a sleepy British town. Well, it doesn't start in a sleepy British town. Okay. We're following Anna Andrews. She's a BBC news anchor. She was, she's been in the business for a long time and she finally two years ago got upgraded to anchor. And this happened because she had a stroke of luck. She was in the right place at the right time and the lady who was the anchor before went left on maternity leave and just never came back. So she said, okay, I'll fill in there. They asked her to fill in and she's been living her best life ever since until the other lady comes back and they say, oh, sorry, we don't need you anymore. See you later, Anna. Bye bye. Peace out. And so she has to figure out a way to get this job back because this is her life. She's lost everything and this is the only thing she's clutching onto. So meanwhile, there is a murder that happens in her hometown and she decides that in order to prove herself worthy of becoming the anchor again, she's gonna go back and cover this story. But it turns out that her ex-husband is Detective Jack Harper, who is also on the case, and the girl who was murdered is someone that both of them know and grew up with. So you have three POVs, you have his, which is Jack's, you have hers, which is Anna's, and you have the killers. And it, I listened to the audiobook and the voice is disguised so you can't tell if it's a man or a woman. It's very intriguing. It has all the tropes. It has all of the red herrings. Um, it does have all of the trigger warnings. As well, abuse, animal abuse, child abuse, domestic abuse. Be warned. I have, I have warned you. But it was so gritty and enthralling and just fast paced and fun to keep up with. I very much enjoyed this. And that's, how, that's where I'm gonna leave it for you. So moving on next, I read The Michigan Murders. This is the true story, true crime story. This is written by Edward Keyes. And it tells the story of seven women, young ladies really, who were killed in Michigan from 1967 to 1969. Um, I do have a personal connection with this case because my mother went to school in Ypsilanti at Eastern Michigan University in 1969 and actually had an encounter with the murderer who is John Norman Collins. In this book, um, they change Edward Keyes, he changes all the names of all the characters. So it was, I think they called him Armstrong, something Armstrong in the book. So I didn't really like that. I wanted to get all the nitty gritty details and it confused it a little bit um, for me. So I, I didn't love that, but it was kind of interesting for me, especially having that personal connection with the case to kind of delve into this case and get the details and the grit and the dirt. And you know, f there's something about thinking that if my mother had made a different choice, um, basically he tried to pick her up on his motorcycle and she refused because she had a letter that she was trying to take to the mailbox to mail out to her boyfriend at the time. So if she had said yes, who knows what could have happened, I may not be here today. So that idea just completely fascinates me and in a very morbid type of way, I don't know why. Um, so I read this book. It was pretty good. John Norman Collins was actually only convicted of the last murder, so the rest are alleged. Um, but 
the things he did to these girls are just absolutely despicable. You would not believe it's true crime. It's so freaking messed up. But this was all in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti area of Michigan. And he was convicted of uh, murdering Karen Sue Bynuman, who was the very last girl to be killed. And he is still alive in Michigan, serving life without parole in Marquette, which is in the UP, as we Michiganders call it. It is in the Upper Peninsula. Don't mind my dog. He sleeps 20 hours a day, but I film a video and he has to just, oh, what's going on? What's going on? Anyway, so I don't rate um, nonfiction books, but I will say as far as the writing goes, it was, it was to the point, direct. I wish he hadn't changed the names, but I understand why he did. Um, there's another book about the same murderer called Terror in Ypsilanti by Gregory A. Fournier, and I definitely want to check that one out too. The next book I read was A Song of Rates and Ruins by Roseanne A. Brown, and just a lovely, lovely fantasy debut author. It's going to be a, a duology. The second one's coming out at the end of August, and that is called A Psalm of Storms and Silence. But just wish he, it's like he's just walking in a circle. I don't. Uh, so this is inspired by West African folklore. We're following two main POVs. You have Princess Karina, who is the princess of Zoran. And you have Malik, who is, so he and his two sisters are refugees from Eshra. And they are coming to Zoran to see if they can get in, but they have to sneak in because Eshrans are not allowed. So whilst we have a cast of all black characters in this book, we do not have inherent racism, but we do have a prejudice based on where you're from. So they have to disguise their accents to make people believe that they're Zirans, Zirenese, I don't remember what they call themselves, but that they're not refugees so that they can be accepted because otherwise they're getting the boot. No one will talk to them. No one will let, they have zero rights. Basically, it's this kind of parallel commentary on racism in our um, culture and society. So I thought that was really interesting to kind of talk about that, with that without actually talking about it, which was super cool. So while Malik is trying to get in, um, this festival is going on called Solstasia. Solstasia. Um, Solstasia. Solstasia festival. I listened to the audiobook too. I still don't remember how it was pronounced. The struggle is real. His little sister gets stolen away by this rape demon thing and he has to get her back. So the dude that takes his little sister says, well, you can have her back, but you have to kill the princess before the end of Solstasia. And so his goal is to kill Karina. On the other hand, Karina's just lost her mother. This is the flip side. She's lost her mother and she has to, she's found some old book where basically it says if you have all these different things, you can resurrect your mother. She is feisty. She is basically just trying to get out. Her sister and her father died 10 years ago and her mother has been isolating her since. She feels trapped. She feels like she can't escape and she does not want to be queen. And so when her mother unexpectedly dies, and this is not a spoiler, it's, in, it's on the blurb, so. Her mother unexpectedly dies. She finds this old spell that's supposed to be able to resurrect her mother. Um, and so that way she does not have to deal with having to be queen. She, she can put things back to the way they were, but she has to have the heart of a king. And in order to meet a king and have access to one, she decides that the winner of this competition during the Solstasia event is going to become her husband and therefore will be king and she will have the heart that she needs. 
So basically, they're trying to kill each other. And gosh, the there's so much representation in this book. There's a lot of mental health rep. Um, Malik is, struggles with panic attacks and anxiety, which I I relate to so hard. And actually, the I think this is a mild spoiler, but there's a point in this book where he in a fantastical way actually uses that anxiety as power and that was the coolest thing for me i i thought that was just beautiful where he was able to harness his anxiety and something that he struggles with every day and turn that into a power against someone else and i think that has to be the, the first time i've heard of at least that this has been done so really roseanne brown is just She's pushing back walls. She's pushing back, back border. She's just coming in strong. She's coming in hot. And she's just waving that flag of victory because this book is killer. No pun intended. Anyway, I guess that's all I'm going to go into for that. Okay, the next book I read this year was The Humans by Matt Haig. And I cannot express to you guys how much I loved this book. In fact, I'm not going to fully go into it because I'm going to do its own review episode for that. I'm gonna do just a straight review of just that book separately because I, I'm so in love with it. Um, but the general gist of it is, there is this guy who makes a mathematical discovery on Earth. The aliens are watching us from afar and they realize that we've made this discovery that's going to change our world and the humans are not ready for it. So they set out a plan of action to destroy this knowledge. So they send one of their people down to Earth. They kill, um, I think his name is Andrew Martin in the book, um, the mathematician. They kill him and they infiltrate his body. Now, the book is the alien as Martin writing back to his people as kind of an ode to humanity, okay? The coolest thing is that he, from this perspective of the book, we are the aliens. So they kind of flip the switch, we are the aliens. He comes down naked, wandering, doesn't speak our language, nothing. He learns English from an issue of Cosmopolitan. This book is hilarious, you guys, watching him stumble around learning the ways of humans and how he has this objective look and perspective over the things that we do. It's heartwarming, it's beautiful, it's, it's literally like, one of the best books I've ever read and I'm I cannot it, it, I think it was published in 2013 so I guess I'm behind on this one after I read Midnight Library I started going down a rabbit hole of Matt Haig books I don't even know how to explain so I'm gonna go back I'm gonna reread this book and I'm going to make a very clear concise outline so that I can tell you exactly how wonderful this book is and force you to read it every human should read this book um, so that got one star. No, I'm kidding. I got five stars. The next book I read this month was Holes by Lewis Sacker. Now this is kind of an old school YA or middle grade um, mystery type. And I read this as part of the Read Harder Challenge, as well as the Michigan Murders book, just to kind of switch up my reading. So this story is about a kid named Stanley Yelnats. He is cursed, his whole family is cursed because of his no good, dirty, rotten, pig stealing great, great grandfather. And it's this really cute um, story. It's set in, in, well, he gets sent to Texas to Camp Green Lake where there's actually no lake. And it's basically a detention center, a juvenile delinquent center for kids and they have to dig holes all day, every day. He's sent there for something he didn't actually do and the plot unfolds that they're actually digging for a reason and it's actually all connected back to his family and his great great dirty rotten no good grandfather whatever it is it 
it's actually really cute. It's got this Western vibe. But yeah, it was, it was just a really cute little middle grade mystery. Um, and there's also a movie about it with Shia LaBeouf. Next, I read Winter Keep by Kristen Cashore, or Kristen Cashore. I'm not sure how she pronounces it. I gave this four stars, you guys. I am obsessed with the Graceling Realm series. So it is not to be uh, a surprise that I had to read this book as soon as it came out. Literally the day it came out, I picked this book up. So this book is different from the rest of the Graceling Realm series in the in a way that um, I heard it described as being more steampunk and less medieval fairy tale, which is true. This book has a lot more emphasis on technological advancement, politics, and a very strong um, discussion of environmentalism, which I really appreciated from Kristen. There is it is dark too. It's a little bit darker than the rest of the books. And it's, um, it does deal with like parental abuse, trauma, and sex being used as a power or also a coping mechanism. So there's that. So just be aware of that. Basically, we're following continuing with Bitter Blue's story in a way, but also, so they've discovered this separate continent, separate from the Seven Kingdoms in the first three books, and they want to scope it out. So Bitter Blue sends out a couple of her envoys and they disappear. So she decides she's going to go over there and see what's up with these, with her people, like where did her people go? And so this book is written from five different perspectives. So you have Bitter Blue, of course. You have Gidden, who we hated in the previous books, but has now come back to have a complete character development scenario. And we like Gidden now, so that's great. We also follow Laviza, who is one of our new characters. And she is, oh, how to describe her? So she's a teen. Both of her parents are very influential people in the community on opposite sides of the political spectrum. She's in school at the university and she is struggling with her really messed up mom. So we have her point of view. Then we have two kind of different points of view. One, we have the keeper, who is this uh, undersea kind of creature that no one knows if she's actually real. It's been said in this country's folklore in the past that there's this keeper and they protect everybody and you also have these other animals that the keeper talks to and it's just a really interesting different perspective other than that you also have the fifth perspective which is of the blue fox whose name is adventure so also in this world the the blue blue foxes only the blue foxes um can communicate telepathically with humans and if they so choose they may bond with one human and then that's their human and they can communicate back and forth with them. I really enjoyed the story. I thought it was great. It wasn't as beloved to me as the rest of the Graceling Realm series. It can't be because they just hold this special place in my heart and it's different enough, but it's also the same enough that I can see the connection here and I enjoy it and I would really be happy if the, the series continued. So there's that. And then I read all four books of the Court of Thorn and Roses series this month, you guys. All freaking four, which was, oh, it was a thing, okay? I gotta say, <clears throat> rereading this series, um, I'd read them before. I'm prepping for... Um, a Court of Silver Masks, I think it's called. Um, the new book of hers to come out mm, this month. 
in like a week or so. So I wanted to reread these, get myself reinvested in this world. And the first thing upon rereading A Court of Thorn and Roses, I remembered exactly how much I love this story, how much I love Sarah J Maas's writing, how she just immediately envelops you into this world. And it's like, there's no, you're, you're sucked in. And I've noticed in um, some of her books since then, she can, she has been accused of doing some like info dumping, but in A Court of Thorns and Roses, I just thought it was so accessible to get into and just so immediate into the action that I didn't feel like that at all. Then again, I did know what was gonna happen, but that was another interesting aspect was that I, knowing where this is going and how far we've come since then, it was really, really cool to look back on that and get that perspective of those little tidbits that she dropped. When I got to the third book, I cried so much. I kept crying, you guys. I love these characters. I'm in love with this world. And the fourth book is kind of a little bit more disappointing on reread, the Court of um, Stars and Frost, Frost and Starlight. I have all of these books. I haven't shown you a single one. What the hell is wrong with me? I have a stack right here. Okay, okay. The only one I don't have is Al Sweeney. But, okay, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't have the mental capacity today to pick these up and hold them. So, you know, it's gonna be what it's gonna be. Anyway, here's all these. I'll pop them up. You've already seen it at this point. <sighs> Anyway, I, if you're an SJM fan, you feel me, you understand me, you can't wait either. If not, then you're going to just glaze right over this anyway, and that's fine too. Um, but you guys, I'm just so excited for this new Sarah J Moss book. I can't tell you. Anyway, so we're just going to move on from that because I really don't have anything new. I don't want to give any spoilers to anyone that hasn't already read it, but if you haven't and you're on the precipice, do it. It's steamy as hell. It's great world building. The magical system is awesome. The characters are wonderful. Um, that's my pitch for Akatar. Next, and this was my most disappointing read for sure of the year so far, but in general, I was so excited for this. So, and this one is If I Disappear by Eliza Jane Brazier. And I honestly hate to say it because this is a debut and I don't want to shit on her. But mm, like you guys, I thought this book was for me. Okay, so it's about this girl, woman really, she's my age and she is super into true crime podcasts hello and she gets a suspicion that her podcast host has been killed or murdered or kidnapped or something and so she runs across the country to to investigate and find out what actually happened so hello this is true crime podcast for me like i thought this book sounded so perfect and i was so excited again read it the day it came out and I was just so disappointed. I, I hate to say it, I really do, but, so it's written in second person POV, which is cool. Like I have no problem with that. I think it's interesting. She's basically writing it from the perspective of Sarah, who is the girl who's going to find the missing person as a letter to Rachel, who is the podcast host. Her, podcast is called Murder She Spoke, which I think is super clever and cute podcast name for a true crime podcast. I wish it was real. So Rachel hasn't posted any episodes for a couple of weeks or something. And so Sarah gets it in her mind that, well, she must be dead. And then Sarah gets in her car and drives across the country and proceeds to stalk Rachel, who she's never met doesn't know anything about other than the clues that she's left her within the podcast. And so I thought, well, this girl's nuts. And so this has to be some kind of 
Ugh, I don't want to get into spoilers. It led me one way. It went a completely different way. And there was so much... Um, there was a huge section of really slow pacing in the middle that I thought was going to, you know, in a, in thrillers, when you have that moment where not just moment, but where like most of the book, you're just confused as hell and you're trying to work out and put the pieces together in your head. And that's like the most fun part of reading thrillers. Well, this book did that. And so I was enjoying it. But then where it went from there was not where I expected to go. And I was so let down and so disappointed for what we went through to get to the end of this. It was a huge shortfall for me. I, I just, <sighs> I thought the true crime stuff didn't feel real to me. I didn't feel like the author was into true crime because of the way she played out some of these characters because if she had been she would know like i hate to say that but like she would know that the statistics of serial killers and the probability of things working out the way she did it is so rare it's possible but it would be so rare and this is even kind of a slight spoiler, I guess, if you know, if you're on the up and up and you know what I'm talking about, but, um, it just didn't work out. I don't think she's a true crime fan. And I don't, I didn't enjoy the book. So there's that. Sorry. Um, and then lastly, I read, um, A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson, and I gave that 3.5 stars. I thought it was really cute. It's a YA, and it's kind of along the same lines, actually, of If I Disappear. And we're following Pippa, who is a senior in high school. Blue Gully down. So she's in high school for her senior project. She is delving into this case from her small town in which this girl Andy Bell was killed four years previously by a guy named Sal, Sal Singh. And she had known Sal slightly as an acquaintance growing up and she thought he was just super sweet and would never believe that he would have killed her. It was a murder-suicide, so he was not around to ask questions about, but his family has been being shunned for four years, and the whole town has turned on them, and she can't accept the fact that Sal would have done this. So for her senior project, she delves into this case, and she realizes that she may be on the right track when she starts to get some pushback and people that are trying to get her to stop. I started this book with the physical book. There was a lot of cute little mixed media stuff in there, so it was fun that way. And then I also finished it on audiobook, and the audio was really good too. There was some sound effects with the interviews and the phone calls that were really interesting, so I feel like both aspects are completely valid. Both um, medias were just as effective and had their own cool ways to take the story in. And... You know, it was a little bit over the top. I don't know if that was just me or if it was because I've been reading so much fantasy and I feel like sometimes it's a little far-fetched in a real life situation, but you know, it was really cute. She did manage to lead me one way and keep the truth away. There's a twist at the end that I definitely didn't see coming. So I definitely recommend it. I thought it was a good book. 3.5 stars for me is good. It's, well, it's above average. That is an above average book. So that's it. That's what I read in the month of January. And so whew, I'm exhausted. If you guys are still here, just bless your heart. I appreciate you more than you know. And that's gonna be it for me today. I will put up my um, other social medias down here, um, Instagram, as well as Goodreads at Reading Riley. And what else, what else, what else? If you've read these books, or if you're thinking about reading these books, or you wanna discuss any of these, get at me in the down below. Let's talk it out. I'm always here for talking stuff out. I would love to talk about these with you and especially the humans keep 
keep an eye out for that review because it's coming. It's going to be very clear and to the point. I promise you that. Um, and I'm going to make you read it because it's fucking amazing. Okay. All right. Anyway, until next time, I will see you guys later. And please remember that life is short. So read Riley. Thank you.